let's imagine we were watching Boris Yeltsin uh, on, on New Year's Eve, uh, and he's telling us about giving us an assessment of how he did as president of uh, of, uh, of Russia, and he's about to anoint uh, Mr. Uh, Putin. Are you watching it on television when it happened? Of course, I remember it very well. I watched it on December uh, 31st. I remember I was crying my eyes out. Uh, it was very sudden. Uh, no matter what the expectations were, when you actually see it and you feel the era, the epoch going away, uh, it's very impressive. What did he say that was you know, important, impressive, emotional for you? Forgive me for what I haven't managed to achieve, for what I have not done. That was, I think, the high emotional point of this address, for me at least. Was he right? To ask forgiveness? It's well, always right. But was he right to, uh, was his assessment, his self-assessment right? It wasn't a self-assessment. He didn't mention specific failings, specific uh, defeats that he meant. He just said that it was a difficult time. I know it was a hard time for you, and I'm sorry that I couldn't make it better. I couldn't make it easier for you. That was his point, and it sounded very human. And it sounds even more this way in retrospect because we had so few admission of faults from this level of power since then. It has been almost 20 years, and who has admitted that he has been wrong since then? That was the human touch that has possibly been lacking during these years. To, to many Russians, what, was, what had happened during those nine years to them? What were their feelings about uh, uh, the hope that maybe they had carried in 1991 uh, and the reality of 99? You know, these uh, impressions, these this feelings uh, about certain years, about certain epochs, they change with the time. The whole legend of the 90s has been in the making during 2000s, partly by social consciousness, partly by uh, efforts of state propaganda. When people say the 90s, Lihi Divinosti, the there is no exact English translation of the term, the the, uh, the, the difficult 90s, the, the hard 90s, uh, they actually mean uh, sometimes one thing, sometimes another. But it was in, in very real truth a very difficult period, the period of uh, tectonic change for very many people. Uh, people really did lose their accustomed lifestyle, uh, lifestyles. Their, their lives underwent dramatic change. For some people, it was a change for the better. I think that in terms of uh, real, um, real quality of life, it was a change for the better for almost everyone because the conditions of the late Soviet Union were, were well nigh intolerable. Uh, I had my childhood in the provinces, uh, and the, the difficulty of just buying food were unimaginable. So retrospectively, the, those mythical 90s, those generalized 90s, I perceived as the time of, uh, for, for some it's the time of catastrophe. For many it's the time that they are not very fond of remembering, because they don't like the image of themselves at that moment. Uh, they have lost their social status, they were forced to do things that they were not accustomed to do. Even if they succeeded, as many people uh, from, uh, for example, who were the Soviet intellectuals, the Soviet intelligentsia, and they went into business, they succeeded. But they had to go through this very difficult and for them very humiliating period. Uh, so that's why, there is, that's why the 90s have such a reputation. So when you watch Yeltsin, when Russians watch Yeltsin, what are they longing for? What, what, what do they think will happen? What do they hope will happen with the new president? The social expectation 
generally works for uh, a few things that may seem contradictory. Uh, for order, yes. For a younger, more predictable, more rational president, because Yeltsin was perceived, especially in the, those last years, starting uh, from 98, I think, he was perceived as uh, unpredictable and uh, rather irrational in his decisions. There was the crisis of 98, and there was the rapid change in the government after that. The, we, what emerged retrospectively as a search for successor, but at that moment it was seen as, as just a uh, chaotic movement of people on the very top. Uh, and society doesn't like that, it likes predictability. So order and predictability, and at the same time, positive change. There was this demand for positive change and for reform, which was associated in turn with younger leadership. Uh, maybe it's not so contradictory now that I list uh, those demands, but still it was the demand at once for more stability and for uh, more change. Yes. Help me understand the adding to the psychological chaos of the time, the apartment bombings in Moscow. So what is, what, what's your question? What uh, you want part to of the Part of the process, part of a generalized fear, uh, a, a desire for safety, terrorism had been emerging. Uh, what role, what importance does it, does it play? I was in Moscow at that time. I remember it very well. Uh, yes, it was a shock, but I would like to, uh, Ah, I know the legend, uh, roughly speaking, that uh, those uh, terroristic acts help bring Putin into power, if we put it just at its most basic. Uh, I want to contradict this a little. In the 90s, uh, we lived in the atmosphere of constant emergency. Those bombings would have ripped apart the... Uh, consciousness of a more stable nation. But in Russia at that time, it was uh, another thing in a row of things that used to happen before that. And sadly, they continued happening after that. So my point is, it was not a, an isolated something that happened and resulted in increased demand for uh, security, for safety, for fighting terrorism. Uh, there was uh, Chechen war at that time. There was the previous one. And for public, uh, I think for, for, for public understanding, it was, again, an unbroken line of wars and terrorist acts and emergencies of another kind, uh, which was, uh, again, it, it was an atmosphere we, we lived in. Cumulatively, of course, it uh, created this demand, but not those events alone. So when Putin uh, is picked by Yeltsin, uh, even factoring in the, the power of the legend, uh, what, is, what is the need, the societal need that Putin is satisfying for uh, Yeltsin? I remember, I think, in... May of 1999, the magazine Commerçant Vlast, uh, which is a weekly, uh, weekly magazine published by Commerçant Publishing House, uh, they had a very curious uh, sociological survey uh, entitled Его разыскивает страна. For him, the country is uh, searching for, the country is looking for him. Uh, they had a survey uh, whom among the um, uh, cinema heroes would you like to have for president? And they had a number of movies, uh, Soviet classics, most of them, some of them Hollywood uh, classics of that moment, uh, and they had a, a poll. Uh, the first place was held by uh, Stirlitz from uh, 
I think you know this uh, classic Soviet uh, TV series, 70 Moments of Spring, uh, about a Soviet spy in uh, Nazi Germany in the last uh, days of, um, of the war, in, in spring of uh, 1945. He is the main hero. The second place was held by uh, Marshal Zhukov from uh, movie Asvobozhdenie, one of the, uh, the, again, classic Soviet movies about the war. Uh, this, at that moment, I remember reading this magazine uh, on subway going to work, and it struck me at that moment as important. I think that such a survey should be held now, that would the results, again, would be, uh, I think, very interesting and characteristic. So the first place was held by whom? Uh, by a secret hero, uh, a, a kind of Superman, uh, who was at the same time a spy, uh, who was a hero in disguise, pretending to be an enemy in order to help uh, Soviet people and to advance the course of war, not on battlefield, but uh, behind the scenes. That was almost exactly the public persona of the uh, last of the successors, the, the new president. At the moment of this publication, he was not a prime minister. Uh, he was head of FSB, and he was not a public figure at all. So he meets he meets what test? He met this specific demand for a savior and a hero and a superman, and at the same time, uh, not a military hero, not the Lebet type person. Uh, maybe even something more uh, intellectual, because Stirlitz is an intellectual figure. He's not a fighter. Uh, he is a, a mastermind. Uh, and he is a kind of Sherlock Holmes of uh, Secret Service, among other things. This very curious and multidimensional demand. It's not just for order at any price, not just for security at any price, because uh, at that, uh, in this case, uh, figures like uh, Lebet or other military type uh, figure would have met this demand. But this is something uh, different. That's very interesting. So he, and as he, as he comes, I mean, people don't really know anything about him, so that he is a, a, a noumena in lots of ways. He, you can project yourself and your desires onto him. Is that what you're saying? Oh, not exactly. Uh, people don't know him personally. No one knows him personally, I think, even at, the, at this point of time, 20 years after. Uh, but still, uh, he, he, as a public figure, has certain, uh, well, a certain role a certain uh, image that he projects. He has his uh, history, he has his previ the previous positions that he held, and he has his public image. And this is exactly that of a person from Secret Services, at the same time a patriot, uh, at the same time a loyal figure to the previous regime, because with all these demands for change, with all the dissatisfaction for Yeltsin, I think the social demand was not for revolutionary change. So the fact that he was a successor actually played in his favor. Because at that moment, uh, the, the state, per se, was already gaining more weight and was already starting to dominate the public sphere, the political system. Uh, so people didn't want uh, a revolutionary. They wanted something new, but they wanted it at a lower price than the price of a drastic revolutionary change. So, uh, when do people, how do people feel about the changes as he begins to initiate them? Uh, uh, taking control of the television networks, uh, moving the oligarchs to another stage and replacing them with different oligarchs, uh, 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 creating, uh, I know it takes time, but creating a vertical power. Uh, how, how are people responding to uh, uh, realizing that, of course, oil prices are going up and economically, uh, life is improving, I gather. Uh, oh, yo, yes, it was improving. Okay, so help me understand. In, in a very real way. It looks like a straight line when we look uh, 
from from the point of view from the point of time as of now but at that moment uh, there was no direct line to be seen there were a mass of news every day everything something was happening uh, a lot of things were happening at once uh, so it wasn't clear that anyone were was pursuing a strategic policy for myself i don't believe there was any strategic plan it looks like that now but that's the usual mistake, what is called the survivor's bias, right? We see the successful uh, things, we see the survivors, and we create a story, uh, people by survivors. We don't see the dead ends of policy. We don't see the losers because they don't, don't tell their story. Mm, I think that uh, what the... Uh, power machine, what the political machine was doing, was trying to survive from day to day and to pursue the, the nearest goals that it could perceive. Uh, it played out in a certain way. I don't think it was the result of any master plan that anyone had uh, in his uh, or her collective pocket. Uh, I was on civil service since 1996, first in uh, municipality and then in the State Duma. I know something a little bit uh, about the inner workings of this decision-making machine. It's anything but strategic. It lives from day to day. Uh, it has no plans. Its plan is to survive and possibly to uh, get new resources uh, to defeat an, an enemy of today and to uh, gather a friend for tomorrow. Three days is its maximum uh, horizon of planning. Uh, again, you see, we speak about this pact of non-participation, meaning that someone said to the people, you stay passive and I feed you. But uh, who could propose such a deal? These uh, economic conditions that we are describing were mostly due to uh, natural resources prices rising. And the uh, Russian government had absolutely no control over that. So it had nothing to offer in a sense. It just happened. What I'm really interested in is how do people feel about this as a change? Do they perceive it? Do they care about it? Are they willing to make a pact that says, I'll look the other way on that, even if it's an accretion, right? I don't believe in a pact. I think, again, I think it's an, a retrospective illusion. It wasn't a pact. It was a, okay, it was a stage in the development uh, of Russian society and Russian political system, of Russian political regime. Uh, it looks like it was something that somebody did on purpose. But in reality, the circumstances were such that this behavior both on the part of society and on the part of uh, the political system, was the most rational and the most easy. Uh, when you talk about authoritarian tendency, and here I find myself in a strange situation of having to defend our political development, you have to keep in mind the previous situation. When you talk about Kremlin taking control over television, uh, you're describing a very real fact, yes, it happened. But uh, at that moment, in the beginning of 2000s, it looked like not the state taking control, but the law taking control over what was previously uh, a playing ground of the oligarchs who acknowledged no law and no order uh, and no authority higher than themselves higher than the, the power of money and the power of political connections. At that moment, in the beginning of 2000s, it was the establishment of the rule of law, or at least it was perceived both by uh, the society outside and by many people who were the actors of those change. If you ask, for example, Alfred Koch, who was instrumental in bringing NTV back to Gazprom, uh, he, wasn't, he was not perceiving himself as uh, playing on the side of the president. Uh, he, was, he saw himself as a defeater of the oligarchy. Uh, again, we can call it a self-delusion or even a retrospective self-delusion. We can assume that maybe he understood his role at the very beginning and he was just willing to do it for any 
profit that he expected to receive. By the way, I don't believe he received a lot uh, for this, and this his subsequent fate uh, is a demonstration of this. Uh, but we have to, again, we have to keep in, in mind how it looked at that moment. It looks very different that now that we remember those events. But at that moment, the situation was uh, different. Public opinion was different. The actors and their agendas were different. When, you, when we talk about something like Beslan, mm -hmm. and we think about it and we see it one way, how did the Russian people see uh, through the terrorist and the anti-terrorist activities, what did they see the uh, the implications of the decision and, and what happened at Beslan? How was was it a central moment? Was it an important moment in the in the in the collective consciousness of the of the people? It was a decisive moment uh, for the political system, not because of the terrorist act itself, but because of the legislative changes that were implemented after this. Uh, the consequences of uh, Beslan tragedy was the breaking up of our electoral mechanism. And this happened, uh, again, as of now, it happened forever. Uh, there was no uh, going back after this. Uh, we have lost the uh, regional elections, the gubernatorial elections, and we haven't got them back, uh, not in any free form. Why? Uh, why? Hmm? Why? Why what? Why we haven't got them back? Why, 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 why did why, you lose them in the first place? What was the argument? The argument was that the terrorist threat necessitated a vertical of power and uh, more, more tight control over regional authorities. It wasn't a very good argument. Uh, I remember even at that moment, and it was a moment of national horror, of course, because of the, uh, of the dreadful details and the scope of this tragedy. But even at that moment, there was a surprise. Why, what, what's, the, what's the connection between a terrorist act in one of the Northern Caucasian republics and the elimination of elections, both gubernatorial and the um, uh, deputies, the single mandate uh, district um, parliamentary elections all over Russia. Of course, it was using the pretext. Uh, and that's why now we see the, uh, this as a decisive moment. Again, not because of the tragedy itself, but because of the reaction. And this is what happens with many terrorist acts. Not only they are horrible in themselves, but they are damaging, extremely damaging in their consequences. I think this is the very mechanism of uh, terrorism. It's not, it doesn't kill so many people as a frontal war uh, of the wars of the 20th century, but it uh, starts the chain of events that severely curtail the freedoms uh, of the country where the terrorist act happens. It expands the uh, possibilities, the resources, the strength of uh, specifically the secret services and of the government in general. That's, that's the double tragedy of terrorism. One of the things we know from talking to people close to uh, President Putin is that he feels strongly that the United States has been involved in fomenting and causing things from the early color revolutions uh, all the way up. What, 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 what is your perception of, uh, of, the, of the perception of the United States involvement and whether that argument works? Uh, of course, I can't uh, know what is passing in the heads of our decision makers. I have heard this rhetoric, of course, time and again from uh, many people on the uh, top level of our uh, hierarchy, uh, power hierarchy. Uh, from my point of view, it's some sort of psychological disorder called external locus of control, if you know how uh, the term. Uh, it's, it's the situation when a person thinks that everything that happens to him or her is determined by some external agent. Uh, it's a very bad thing because it uh, makes you lose uh, your existence as a real person. It makes you exist only as a focus of others' wills. Uh, and this is the... Uh, strange and phantasmagoric picture of the Russia of today as painted by the state media. Uh, wh wh what is Russia? Russia is something that is threatened from the outside. 
And if there is any in threat from the inside, this is also because of somebody uh, external of some external will. Uh, it could not be more, more absurd. It's absurd in itself, but it's specifically absurd in case of Russia, which is a uh, Again, a bigger complex society uh, whose problems and victories and uh, achievements and defeats are all determined by internal uh, reasons, by internal factors. So again, it couldn't be more, uh, more stupid. I would not go into the question of whether they believe it really or they just uh, pretend to believe it. I don't think it matters. It's the specific consciousness of the people from uh, with the Secret Service background. They perceive the world as this great playing ground of secret forces. Uh, they believe in conspiracy theories of every kind. And there is this, uh, again, this, this additional, uh, additional curse uh, of today's Russia. It's that uh, people in power People on the top levels of power belong to a very specific generation. They are mostly males aged 60 plus, if you look at the demography of the thing. Uh, and this uh, generation, people born in the 50s, uh, is, has been the most Soviet generation of all. They were born after the war, and the war has uh, severed any ties uh, of the Soviet Russia with the previous Russia by just killing off all the people who could remember the time before the Soviet uh, Revolution. And these are the people who underwent the full uh, Soviet indoctrination, starting from the kindergarten and to the higher school. And those of them who were, for example, got candidates' degrees or doctor's degrees, they were indoctrinated into the Marxist theory. Even if they thought they don't believe it, they just have to do the lip service. Unfortunately, we are influenced not just by what we believe in, but what we think the others believe and what we have to repeat, it also sort of seeps into our brain. Uh, they were very much grown up when uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union happened. That's why it was so much a tragedy for them, because they were already at the age when people don't like uh, rapid and dramatic changes. So it was the full Soviet generation, the most Soviet one. It, it's uniquely so. Those who are younger, every next generation is less and less Soviet. And these very people are those that hold the power today. They dominate the power pyramid. Uh, they think that, uh, of course, we all tend to think of ourselves as representatives of humanity. So they think that all the other people, the Russian society in general, also holds the same beliefs and the same system of values, but that's not the fact. So for uh, Russian political development, for the development of Russian society, the simple generational change will do more than it's usually rational to expect because we are in this very specific situation demographically. That's fascinating. Really interesting. That, that's political demography. The manifestation, of course, of it is his Munich speech in 2007 where he, he declares essentially uh, at one level, Russia is now becoming a superior uh, uh, force in the world under my leadership, and the world uh, must leave us alone or face the consequences of a new and powerful Russia. I remember when this Munich speech happened, it, it wasn't perceived at that moment as something, as a, as a milestone. But now again, retrospectively, it's a great milestone. For mostly for, for foreign observers, for external audiences more than for uh, Russian audiences. Uh, why is it such a milestone? What is because of what I've just said, or something you bring you can bring I, to I it? I hear it mentioned again, uh, mostly by. Uh, foreign uh, commentators by uh, uh, foreign politicians. Uh, it, it wasn't such a big deal for, for the Russian audience. But again, it was addressed to external audience, so maybe that's natural. What do you think he was trying to do, by the way, parenthetically, with no, all no, of that? No, no, no. I'm all not right, going into, I, I into, into any, anybody's head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I know the story, this, this great story of uh, right. an unanswered love and disappointment and betrayal, and we were trying to be good, and you rejected all, all our advances, and you stabbed us in the back multiple times, and now we are disappointed. But we still want your love and, and respect and whatever, but we can't get it, therefore uh, we will go 
a week and a half. I know the story. I have heard it a number of times. I don't know how much of this is self-delusion, how much of this is propaganda, how much of this is genuine uh, feelings or emotions. Do emotions matter on this level? Again, I don't know. It's, 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 such, a, it's such a mess of things. Are people happy that Putin steps back and becomes prime minister and Medvedev ah. is president? Does it mean an opening? Does it signal a change? Does it, is it an evolution? I, I remember, yes, I remember this, uh, this moment. Uh, for the uh, power machine, for the political uh, machine, uh, it was a moment of relief because uh, before that uh, there were months of great tension uh, with this uh, successor game being played all over again. Any decision was announced, it was a relief. Uh, for the society in general, I don't know, it, these were, uh, I think, the, the best times for uh, the... Uh, well, for, for the political regime in general, the times of the highest oil prices, the time of most uh, unity within the power, uh, the times when the vertical of power was less of an illusion than at any other moment. Uh, so they could afford any decision. That was the general feeling. Things just couldn't go wrong because everything goes right. And it's a uh, med that, that was the, Yes, that was the mood of the moment now that I remember. And, and Medvedev is a representative, maybe, of... Is he in that age group, or is he younger? He's slightly younger. Uh, as far as I can see, he's uh, being what he is and being where he is, he's sort of trying to... Um, uh, to play up to the standards of the older generation. Uh, he, he's trying to blend in. Because, again, the higher levels of our power structure are dominated by this very specific group of people, both uh, age-wise and background-wise, uh, so to say. Not just people of a certain age, but people with of certain upbringing, of certain education, of certain set of values, brought up in uh, very specific uh, surroundings and having had their careers in very specific structures, vertically integrated structures, a military, a secret service, law enforcement mostly. Putin takes it back. The people hit the streets. At least some of the people hit the streets. Why? Quite, quite a lot of them. Why? I remember this moment too. Uh, it was a moment of uh, not just disappointment for many uh, for many people in russia for the more educated for the urban dwellers for the younger people uh, it was to put it simply it was seen as, a, as an insult this decision so unexpected uh, without any previous public discussion without any reason given just we have decided to change places again uh, it was this cavalier mode of doing it, which uh, clashed with the growing, um, I would say, maturity of Russian society. Uh, even if this uh, non-participation pact was, wasn't in existence, still uh, in the beginning, in, in the middle of 2000s, people were, yes, they were happy to let uh, political life go its own way. But then, with the rising uh, incomes, with the better life conditions, with the uh, information era hitting in, uh, with the freer flow of information, with more people traveling abroad, political consciousness also arose, evoke, I would say. People wanted uh, to be heard. People wanted to participate. People wanted to feel themselves uh, important, to feel themselves political actors. Uh, so this was the growth of Russian society. I would also remind you that uh, in, in the end of 2000s, in the beginning of 2010, we saw the emergence of Russian organized civil society. What could be 
justly termed the Russian civic renaissance. We saw the NGOs. We saw the emergence of broad charities. It was a very new thing for Russians. It was the thing that they had to learn how to do because there was no precedent. There was nothing like uh, any cooperation. Uh, in, of course, in Soviet uh, times, it was strictly forbidden. All this had to be done by the state and by the state only. In the 90s, in early 2000s, there was uh, very little of this because people were so poor and so very much intent on survival. But then it started to emerge. And it's a very great school for cooperation. It's the school for becoming citizens. So this was a very unfortunate moment for a political decision of this kind because people already started to feel themselves citizens. And at this very moment, they received this slap in the face. So that's why there was this public outrage, and it was totally unexpected uh, from within of the power system, from the within of the political system, which be got used to the public indifference, to the society minding its own business. And when the elections, the Duma elections, are shown to be uh, manipulated, rigged, video cameras show up, the web is starting to exist. Uh, that's a societal uh, tectonic shift almost, it feels yes. like. Those elections saw the emergence of volunteers, of overseers, uh, of people who were present at the elections at the counting of votes and who wanted to see that uh, everything is done according to the law. And this was a new thing. This was the first time ever. And for the political machine, again, it was a surprise. Like, we're not doing anything different from what we used to do. Why suddenly it became a problem? It wasn't a problem for years ago, so what, what's happening now? What did happen? How did it happen? Why did it happen? It happened exactly because of the reasons that I have uh, just delineated. It's a very natural process. It's the process described by political science time and again. Now, again, people who have uh, solved the question of survival, of physical survival, are people who have uh, uh, who got a little bit of free time on their hands, people who became part of the uh, information uh, sphere of media field who began to uh, participate in social media. They would want uh, their civic rights. They would want political participation. This is the next stage. It's the most natural thing that could happen. And if you're Vladimir Putin sitting in the Kremlin, you don't own a computer, or at least you don't use a computer, you uh, don't trust the computer and you don't trust the internet because this is some CIA project. Tell me that again. What do you mean? Uh, haven't, you, haven't you heard this, this famous quotation that uh, internet has started, has emerged as a CIA project and it has developed as a CIA project ever since? Who says that? The president of the Russian Federation. You haven't heard it? No. It's quite famous. Well, that explains a lot. Uh, if you are sitting there and you suddenly, however many thousands of people are standing on an island outside of your office and holding signs that say stop Putin, that's got to be a serious change and you've got to wonder why. Yes, and then you have to, uh, to come with some explanation. An explanation, of course, is that Hillary Clinton has done that. Isn't it the most evident answer? And why Hillary Clinton? Uh, that, I think that was, again, some unfortunate um, sequence of events. Uh, she was the state secretary. Uh, there always, for some reason, there always has to be an American female politician to be demonized by the Russian political consciousness. It used to be Madeleine Albright, then it was Condoleezza Rice, uh, then it was Hillary Clinton, and the lesser demons uh, like... Um, Victoria Nuland or uh, Jennifer Psaki. Uh, I don't know why that is. Maybe it has some roots in our folklore or whatever. I'm not ready to go into this. But I, I just see this tendency. Yeah, well, it's absolutely true that he, he does say and is quite angry about the fact that she seems to have initiated uh, uh, the march, but it isn't true that that was where the protests came from. They sound like grassroots uh, to me, do they to you? Truth is in the eye of the beholder of like beauty. Uh, 
for me, any political process will always be determined by internal factors. <laughs> I'm a political scientist, for God's sake. I don't believe in uh, magicians from abroad who make uh, passes and who uh, change the weather in, in Moscow. Uh, no more do I believe that any funding, even if it did go into NGOs, was instrumental to bringing up mass protest. You can bribe people into protesting. Uh, that, that's... That's just a fairy tale again. One of the things that we've seen is the development of various uh, methods using the web, using cyber, using information, using propaganda to, uh, that is sort of adopted either on an ad hoc basis or actually in a kind of formal way by the Kremlin to get into the game, the social media game, uh, the inf internet wars game. I mean, uh, 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 from what some people tell us, he sees the web, he sees the West, and he says, I want to play this game. Uh, does it make sense to you? So what, what, what's your question? Is, he, is that true? Does he, is, is his response uh, uh, obvious, uh, uh, a manifest in any way that you can see or that you know about? Again, it's not him. It's, it's the system. It's, it's the machine. It's a pretty big machine. Uh, again, Russia is a state-centered country, a state-dominated country. Uh, so we have uh, a lot of uh, civil servants, and we have even more people who are working for the state in, indirectly, people who work in state media, in state banks, state corporations, etc. All this is this big state machine. So we have quite a lot of decision makers, each on his or her own level and each with his or her level of competence. Uh, personally, as a scientist, I do not very much, uh, I do not fully endorse the personalist autocracy uh, theory. Uh, I think that Russia is ruled by collective bureaucracy. And uh, it's a quite wide social strata. Of course, not all decision makers are equally powerful. Uh, we are usually told that the most important decisions are made by the president and his five friends. Uh, the names of those five friends change uh, from time to time. There are people who go into that. Uh, I do not very much, uh, I'm not interested that, 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 that much in this personalistic politics. Because I perceive the political machine as a collective decision maker, uh, and the, its decisions are determined very much by internal competition and by fight for resources, not by anyone's specific will. So the information era came for everyone. It wasn't something that happened in the West and then Russia had to react. It happened for the society, for the simple I don't like the word, for the citizens. It happened for the politicians. It happened for the uh, state services. It happened for the ministries uh, and for the army, for everyone. Everyone uh, was using these uh, instruments, these mechanisms. Uh, so there was no response, as, as, as you put it. Uh, still on the top, it would be just to say, uh, on the top of our uh, power pyramid, there was this deep distrust of the internet, of the free flow of information, as of something which you can't control and don't quite understand. The attempts to control it were, uh, I think, chaotic and random and have remained so. To, to the present moment. We never had anything like Chinese policy. Uh, and the Chinese policy started 20 years before now. We have nothing of this kind. No, no strategy, no deep planning here as in every other sphere. Uh, we have this tactic of random responses to threats as they are perceived on a daily basis, on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. So, so we had a very interesting conversation with somebody talking about the evolution of propaganda in the state from a, an argument that uh, let us try to convince you with our propaganda to see our side of the picture to something that is that the web uniquely satisfies, which is we'll give you 
uh, instead of justifying what we're doing, we will give you a lot of different things to argue with. We will make create the, the white noise, yes. Exactly. We'll make everything noise. as opaque as possible. Yes. Uh, have you noticed this? Ah, there are people who are more into studying propaganda than me. I would mention Peter Pomerantsev, who has published a famous book about this, uh, or um, Vasily Gatov, who is a uh, Russian media expert now based in the uh, United States. So these are people who understand more about this than I do. I don't follow the intricacies uh, of uh, state television. Uh, but yes, it is impossible not to perceive this change, this transformation, this what is popularly called post-truth situation, where there is no version, uh, the no correct version which is imposed upon you uh, by the state, but there's this cacophony of versions which is trying to convince you that there is no truth, that any, any uh, scenario is as likely as any other. Any opinion is as... Uh, viable as any other opinion. When you think of it, what is the impact on the population? What happens then in a society where such a thing is occurring? Again, I think this is a phase. Humanity will figure out how to deal with this post-truth situation. Uh, so far, we have the destruction of the previous hierarchies of, of truth, where there was uh, almost in any country, in any political system, a kind of monopoly for uh, opinions. Uh, either it was a monopoly of the state, or it was a monopoly of corporations which owned the media, or it was a monopoly of the uh, generally understood academia, the educated people who were the producers of the correct opinion, of the right uh, thing to uh, believe. With the information age, with the internet era, we have the destruction, the fall of this great pyramid. Uh, basically, this is the democratization process. The people have become not just uh, consumers of content, but producers of content. This has created this situation which is currently perceived as chaotic and post-truth, where anyone can say anything. But I think that new hierarchies will form themselves. We do not yet know how this post-truth future or post-post-truth future will look, but there is no going back to the monopoly. Uh, the nearest parallel that I can perceive is with the uh, invention of um, publishing. Uh, the Gutenberg Press. Before that, the written book was monopolized. Uh, the written the the written knowledge was monopolized by church. It was the producer of content uh, of uh, the Middle Ages. And then, with the emergence of the press, anyone or almost anyone could print anything. It produced tectonic political effects because uh, if we look at history, what were the people printing? after Gutenberg, three things. Uh, first, um, religious literature. Uh, second, uh, music notes. And third, uh, erotic pictures. So to speak in our modern terms, extremist literature, entertainment, and pornography. That was the first use of the newly invented printing press. This influenced public consciousness. This influenced political behavior. This broke up the Christendom, the general community of Christian countries under the Pope of Rome. This introduced the nation state. This introduced the idea of uh, ethnic nation because the printing of Bibles on uh, national tongues did that. Uh, this contributed to the spread of uh, reformed church which again broke up this Christendom unity. This produced religious wars. It produced many things. So it was a kind of global catastrophe of this time, exactly like the internet of today, only we hope for a little bit less of religious wars. But even this is a, <coughs> is a vague hope at best. So these are changers uh, and the humanity has to deal with that somehow. Coming back to our little local uh, propaganda, again, this new era arrived for everyone. Uh, so the state, the state media, the state political management had to try to make use of this. 
Uh, I must say that uh, on the internet, they were not very much of a success, and they are not that at this moment. They don't understand how it works. Uh, they don't understand the difference between the television and the internet. They just think that it's uh, a kind of a channel that you transmit your message through. They don't understand that the point of internet is communication, is given back, uh, give and take. Uh, so that's why uh, their internet presence, the state internet presence, is not so much of a, a success as state television uh, presence. The situation with the consumption of media is very interesting in, in Russia. The usual simplistic picture that old people watch TV and young people are on the internet is not exactly correct. Uh, TV is still number one uh, media. But for the reason which is not often understood by external audiences, uh, the Russian people don't go to TV for news. They don't go to TV for information. Television is perceived as the voice of the state, the voice of power. And because you are so much dependent on the state in your daily life, because so much danger can come, can come from the state, you have to keep an eye on what they are up to. So you listen to this news, you listen to your weekly dose of Kiselev or Solovyov or whomever you prefer, and you try to tune your ear to the message and to understand what are they going to do. Uh, what is the hot topic now? What will happen tomorrow? Do I have to sell the rubles and buy dollars? Do I have to buy up uh, salt? Uh, or do I have to, sh should I... Uh, take mortgage today or maybe wait uh, a little bit. What What is the, uh, will they close up the frontiers? Will will there be no free exit from, from Russia t abroad tomorrow or maybe not? So that's what the people are trying to uh, understand. That's why they will and they do uh, listen to the uh, state television. There is no other uh, sort of television. So messages about Crimea or Ukraine? Are they paying attention? Does it matter? The Crimean youth area was really quite short-lived. It was the spring and summer of 2014. Its pinnacle were the May celebrations in 2014. And starting autumn, the economic crisis hit in, the incomes began to go down, and this youth area declined. It has no impact on this understanding that Crimea belongs to Russia, please understand me rightly. But the euphoria, the joy, the holiday, and the celebration, they were over by the end of the year. So now let me ask you about the American election of 2016. Uh, and R R Russian, the Russian sensibility when suddenly the allegation appears that it, it, it seems Russia is trying to influence the American election. This is the summer of 16, intensifying into the fall. And now, a done deal as far as the American intelligence services are concerned. How, is it, how does it play in Russia? How is it perceived? Uh, and uh, are people happy about it? Uh, is it of no consequence? Help me understand. It's impossible to speak for the society in general. Uh, there was a lot of media attention in Russian media during and before and after the uh, American presidential elections. Uh, it's a known thing that Russian television is mostly about stories of what happens in foreign countries. It's either Ukraine or it's Syria or it's United States or it's Europe uh, overrun by migrants or whatever. Uh, it's a kind of TV series which uh, the state TV feeds the people with. It's free entertainment. Let's just understand it at its face value. It's free emotions. Uh, you see, if you don't have much of an internal political life, if you can't express the tension or the protest or the disagreement that you feel, uh, then you have to have something else, some outlet for your emotions. And this is, uh, again, it's, it's free, it's safe. Uh, it doesn't entail any demand for action on your part. You just consume it. 
So it's it's purely uh, TV series. It's your house of cards. It's your boss. It's your Sopranos, whatever you prefer. So you have this season upon season and episode upon episode of those stories about somebody else. Uh, I think this is more or less an understood uh, a conscience a conscience policy on the part of state TV. We don't focus on uh, internal problems because, or even on internal news a lot because internal news demand reaction and external, not so much. Uh, I can't quite say uh, what is the, uh, given this situation, what is the reaction of the average Russian TV viewer or con consumer of this news? Uh, I think he's or she is being entertained. Uh, on one hand, on the other hand, there is this growing irritation with exactly the absence of the agenda, which is of most interest to the people themselves. I am interested in issues number one, three, and four, and then I turn on TV and then I hear or read what the officials are saying, they are speaking about something else. So there's, there's this gap in the agenda and it produces uh, a lot of uh, I think so far more or less hidden, but it manifests itself from time to time, even in mass protest. This public irritation, public dissatisfaction, uh, about the specifically about the Russian involvement in uh, foreign elections, not just uh, American. As far as I can see, the presentation, the media presentation of this uh, plot of this story is twofold. First, uh, there is, of course, there is denial. And there is this analyst talk about it being paranoia, schizophrenia, hyster hysteria, whatever the medical diagnosis of today that happens to be. Uh, see, they are using this Russian story for their own internal political bargaining, whatever, competition or something. Or they are trying to harass poor President Trump, who is trying to do good to his country, and he is being uh, constrained on all sides by those uh, bullshit. Russian uh, interference stories. That's one type of presentation. Another type is what I would call hidden pride. We deny it, but at the same time, we are sort of proud of it. Uh, it's like um, it's like the polite people in Crimea. They are not ours, but yet we know they are ours, and we are sort of proud of them. Uh, so you see, we are so mighty, and we are so powerful, and we are so clever. Remember the Stirlitz trope, uh, that we can influence the things that are going uh, in other democracies which are considering themselves so powerful and mighty and clever. And so we are too clever for them, it appears, which is a kind of a source of pride. Let me ask one. Other things? Just one question. <clears throat> in 2011, when it was announced that Putin would come back in a bit of would step down from the presidency. Uh, many people told us that uh, those who were enthusiastic about democracy all these years, they felt insulted. Those who, were, um, those who were enthusiastic about what? Democracy. Ah, democracy, okay. <coughs> that they felt insulted by this moment. Did you feel that way? And can you describe that feeling? I think I have described it in, the, in answering the, the same question previously. Uh, it was a specific historic moment in the development of Russian society when people began to feel themselves citizens. It's not the question of individual emotions. Uh, it's more of a question of the stage that society has reached in its growth. Th that was uh, my point. Uh, if you speak about my personal feelings, uh, I was unpleasantly surprised. I don't know if anyone's individual emotions again matter at this uh, point. I still think it was a very unfortunate decision uh, entailing a lot of consequences that appeared after this. But Thank you. People say, aren't we the voters supposed to make this decision? Yes, yes, that, that, was, that was one of the points of dissatisfaction. Uh, that, that it was such an uh, behind the stage agreement that it was announced in such an offhand way. If you remember the, the uh, TV coverage, like they came and said, well, we have a surprise for you. <laughs> uh, the, the presentation itself was, was unfortunate. 
not just the the subject matter but the, the presentation thank you thank you thank you